to resist any basic change in that constitution which would have the effect of re-centralizing government or remilitarizing the society or limiting in any way the freedom of expression. Freedom of expression led to an explosion of Japanese popular culture. New songs, new dances, and new movies. Filmmaker Akira Kurosawa, on location for the first time since the war, felt a new sense of creative freedom. The joys of youth, a boy and a girl having a picnic. These were subjects forbidden during the war. That was typical of the way the Japanese army thought. Shooting fields of flowers, romance, innocent playing, all this would have been censored. I was thrilled that we were finally allowed to shoot scenes like this. Regrets for Our Youth was a groundbreaking film about the struggle of a modern woman in pre-war Japan. At the time, the status of Japanese women was very low. I thought I would do a story in which women have their own ideas and self-awareness. The story is a spiritual odyssey that takes the heroine from the city to the hard life of the country. It was the story of an individual, not the needs of the nation, and that was powerful in post-war Japan. In 1946, half of Japan's population lived off the land. Many were tenant farmers, bitterly poor, tilling the soil for a handful of rich landlords. To stave off rising discontent, the occupation ordered its most enduring change, land reform. MacArthur forced the Japanese government to buy over 30 million parcels of land and sell it cheaply to the farmers. MacArthur once said that a farmer without his own land is like a man without a soul. Nozaka, who was one of the leaders in the uh, Communist Party, had told me personally that, that the land reform had undermined the Communist Party because peasants who would otherwise have been adherents to the Communist principles had become capitalists. Land reform created a new class of conservatives in Japan. Labor reform set free more radical elements. Labor unions were established very quickly. In the course of history, this was a very unusual development. A country that wins a war occupies the nation it is defeated and installs independent labor unions. Japanese labor unions were very lucky. And like bamboo shoots, they sprang up. In the first year of the occupation, four and a half million workers joined labor unions. For years, wages and union activity had been suppressed by the military and the zaibatsu. Now, with unemployment and inflation rising, workers were ready for more radical action. One of the first bold moves caught everyone by surprise. Late in 1945, rail workers seized control of the Tokyo train and trolley system and let everyone ride for free. On May Day, 1946, in the biggest demonstration in the nation's history, 
over two million men, women, and children took to the streets to demand wage increases, political power, and worker control of the factories. By the fall, over a hundred strikes hit Japanese industries, from newspapers to car factories to movie studios. The movement peaked in the winter of 1947, when confident labor leaders called for a general strike, a display of political power intended to shut down the entire country. The February 1st general strike, from the point of view of most workers, was an attempt to help them eat better and get higher wages. But from the point of view of the Communist Party, it was an attempt to seize power and topple the Yoshida cabinet. Yoshida was the enemy of the left. He called the labor unions lawless. He mocked the economic reforms as revolution from above, leading to revolution from below. As the general strike approached, said Yoshida, Japan was submerged in a sea of red flags. The plan was to make this the biggest strike the world had ever seen. Every union had agreed to participate in this general strike. All the factories, all the offices would have been shut down. All of Japan would have been a ghost town. Some members of the occupation worried that democracy was going too far. Concern in the occupation, especially among General Willoughby and his people, the communists were gaining control of the labor unions, and there was some truth to that. If the trains had stopped running, communications had been cut off, food was very short, shelter was, was short also, it would have been a situation closely approaching anarchy. <laughs> MacArthur banned the general strike. His action crippled the communists. But many Japanese workers felt betrayed by the American reformers who had given the unions the right to strike. It was a signal of reversals to come. By 1947, events outside Japan were starting to change the course of occupation policy. In China, communist forces led by Mao Zedong were routing the armies led by America's ally, Chiang Kai-shek. In Eastern Europe, new communist regimes emerged. Many influential Americans feared that the Soviet Union, led by Joseph Stalin, was directing a campaign to spread communism throughout the world. We have permitted Soviet Russia to continue a policy of persecution and slaughter dooming our neighbor nations and ourselves to reap a rotted harvest of appeasement. This choice must be God against Stalinism. George Kennan was the man who wrote the American blueprint for containing communism. He looked at Japan and concluded that the occupation reforms were paving the way for a communist takeover. To Kennan, the occupation had brought democracy, but not prosperity. He saw the weakness of Japan's economy as fertile soil for the growth of communism. As the Cold War became apparent, then there was this powerful argument that uh, we can't afford to weaken Japan any further because Japan has got to be a bulwark of uh, the Western defense system. And all these reforms better, this better stop get down to the business of rebuilding the Japanese economy. To change the course of the occupation, George Kennan flew to Japan. He was followed by the Undersecretary of the Army, William Draper. A former investment banker, Draper was known as the Wall Street General. Draper tried to persuade MacArthur to stop punishing big business in Japan and start building up the country. I personally talked to Draper, to Kennan. They had no vision of a future Japan except uh, a, a strong economic giant and a, and a barrier to communism. But there was no idealism in it at all. It was nothing about democracy. 
SCAP's reformers had pushed economic democracy.